England and ran an orphanage. And in his time, he was, he, he's somebody that you should read about, somebody that would, would really inspire you. As I first, when I first learned about him and read his story, I was amazed by his level of faith. And here's what he committed to. He committed to never, ever asking another person to financially give and support his orphanage, but to only when needs arose to pray and ask God to supply for that need and then to see God meet those needs. There's a story told in his biography about one particular evening he was in his study and he was praying and his orphanage was, had grown from a, a very few small children to over a hundred children. And his wife comes in and she says, George, I have to let you know we don't have enough milk for in the morning for all the children, enough milk to make oatmeal for all the children. And he quietly put his pen down and he turned and instead of panicking and, and fretting and worrying, he looked at his wife and he said, we need to pray. And so he and his wife and a couple of other of the employees and the workers of the orphanage got together and they prayed and they prayed to ask God and they told God their need. God, we need milk and we need to, to supply this and we need somehow you to make this happen. And they began to pray that prayer. And as they were praying that prayer and they closed that prayer out and, and expecting the Lord to meet that prayer, there was a knock at the door. And, and no kidding, knock at the door. His wife goes and answers the door. A person says, the Lord told me to come and to give you this. And he hands her an envelope. She opens it. And there's more than enough financial means in there to meet all of the need that they had for those children. And then over the next hour, two more people come and knock on the door and say, the Lord told me to come and to give this, this, this money to you because you have a need and he wants to meet it. And as I read about that, I thought, I want to pray like that. I want to pray and see God within moments meet and answer those prayers in a powerful way. This is what God has saved us to do. This is, if you are a follower of Jesus today, the Bible says that God chose you before the foundation of the world and he chose you to pray and to call on him and for him to answer your prayers and to see him work and move in your life. This is the work that God has called us for. This is the work that he's called you for. George Mueller was a man just like us who just called on God. There was nothing special about him. He wasn't in any way different than you or I. He was just a man who said, I'm going to believe God for the things that I need in my life. And I'm going to call out to God. And he saw God do tremendous and amazing things and gave all the glory to God for what God did through his life. And all of us have the exact same opportunity to do the same thing with our lives each and every day. To call out to the God. God has made himself infinitely available to you. And he wants you to pray. And he wants you to call on him. And he wants you to believe him. And he wants to do tremendous and mighty and powerful things through your life. So that you get to see him work. See him move in all to his glory and for your good. And we see this modeled in Jesus. Jesus was such a powerful man of prayer. He spent hours in prayer. His private life was so important to him because his private life dictated what his public life looked like. And his followers, his earliest followers, his disciples saw the power of prayer that Jesus had. And they saw him praying one day and they came to him and in Luke 11, 1, they just say, they made a simple request, Lord, teach us to pray. They saw him pray and they saw God do mighty powerful work through him. And so he's, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to pray like you. Teach us to pray how you pray. The disciples asked Jesus a lot of questions and he didn't answer every single one of them. In fact, some of them he would answer in sort of weird ways, ways that they would begin to understand later. But this request, Lord, teach us to pray, he gladly answered it and answered it very clearly. And he laid down for us what we know, what, what you probably know as the Lord's Prayer. And I don't, it's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is actually in John 17 where Jesus prays for his followers and for all of us. You can go and read that. This is actually what I would call the model prayer. And it's uh, the, way, uh, the best way to think about this is this is like the table of contents of prayer. Jesus lays out for us, here's how the things that we should pray for, and, and really, I think, the order in which we should pray for these things. 
And then when it comes to prayer, here, here's some things that we got to just bring to the surface, that there are certain tensions involved in prayer. And people will bring this up. There, there's just certain tensions. For example, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, why do I need to pray? If God's already going to do something, why do I even need to pray about it? If God already knows what I need, then why do I need to pray about this? Does prayer even really change anything? And, and for some of us, you might even be wondering, does prayer even work? I mean, I've prayed before and nothing happened. Nothing changed. Everything just stayed exactly the same. It seemed like what was going to happen just was all, is exactly what happened in my prayer. Either it didn't get past the ceiling, God said no, God didn't hear it, I'm not sure. But it just doesn't seem to work very well at all for me. And we want to ask over the next few weeks, what kind of prayer actually works? What kind of prayer actually, just like George Mueller, gets to see God answer, work, move, do tremendous and mighty things? What kind of prayer? How do we actually pray and begin to see God work, see God move? How do we resolve some of these tensions? And we're not going to resolve all of them today. We're going to do it over the next few weeks as we look at this very important discipline of prayer and calling out to God. And so to kind of, to start that off, let me just ask you, where are you on this scale? You see it on your outline, it'll be on the screen here. Where are you in your prayer life? And you don't have to answer out loud, of course, but just kind of quietly to yourself, just ask, where am I on this? Where am I? Do I never pray? Is prayer just not even something I think about? Do I pray sometimes? Like if things get really, really bad, things get really, really big, like I just, I know that I have no other option, prayer, then I will pray. Do you pray often, you know, three, five times a week? It, it is a part of your life. Or do you pray as the Bible instructs us, pray continually, pray every moment of every day and learn that, that relational conversation that God has made available to us through prayer. Now, where are you on this scale? And, and just begin to think about your life. Begin to think about this past week. How much time did you spend in prayer? And the goal here over these next few weeks as we look at this important uh, uh, discipline of prayer is not to, you know, become prayer giant, but to maybe move one step. Maybe if you never pray, maybe that you pray sometimes or you pray sometimes, maybe that you pray often or if you pray often, that you pray consistently and always. And God wants all of us to be in that last category where we pray consistently and pray always, but it's a step and it's a process. So here's what we want to do. Why pray? Why do we pray? Why do we need to pray? And there's a few things, at least three, that we can think about. And there's probably more than this, but these are just three that come straight to the surface as we ask that question of why prayer is so important. First, prayer communicates trust in Jesus. It communicates trust. It communicates trust to me that, that I believe that I trust in Jesus. And I need to remind myself of that from very often. Because my heart is fickle, I'm prone to wander, I'm prone to walk away, and I need to communicate and remind myself who I am and who Jesus is. And I need to communicate to myself and to others around me that Jesus is the one who controls the outcomes of my life. That I trust him with every single aspect, every single dynamic, that I am wholly and fully dependent upon him. And prayer, it, it brings a level of humility into my life that I need to maintain and constantly walk in, that I am underneath and submissive to the God of heaven, and, and, and I want everything that he wants for my life. And so prayer communicates that trust that I fully and wholeheartedly trust Jesus with every aspect of my life. A second thing of why prayer is that prayer grows my relationship with Jesus, I heard one pastor say it like this, and I love this phrase. He said, prayer is not a button that we push. Prayer is a relationship that we pursue. Prayer is not a button that you just go, okay, God, I've got this need. Let me push, or I've got this need. Let me pull the handle and see what comes out the other side. Now, that's not how prayer is at all. But prayer is this constant, consistent relationship that we pursue over a lifetime with God, that we grow closer to him, we grow closer to Jesus, we begin to understand his heart and therefore we understand his hand as we read his word and as his word leads us to prayer and his word leads us to this closeness and this intimacy that we're to have with Jesus. Prayer is how we grow in this closeness, how we sense the very presence of the living God in to my life. Third is that prayer aligns my will with Jesus with Jesus's will. It aligns my will with his. And this is where we're gonna spend most of our time today. Prayer doesn't get you, this is so important. Prayer doesn't get you ready for God's work. Prayer is God's work. 
Prayer doesn't just get me ready for it. Prayer is the work of God. If I want to see God work in my life, I want to see him move, see him act. The quickest way to get God to work and to move and, and to see him move in my life is to pray. I don't just immediately go out and start trying to fix everything, but I immediately stop and pause and pray and submit, communicate trust, align my will with his and begin to search out and discern and know how, what is the will of God in this moment of my life. And people ask often like, how long should I be in prayer? How long do I pray? It's very simple answer. Your prayers should take as long as it takes for you to align your will with God's will. That's how long your prayers have to be. Too often we spend, try to spend hours, days, weeks, months praying and asking, praying and asking. When if we would spend, spend hours, weeks, and months searching and discerning God's will, that is the, the place where we need to spend most of our time praying. Once we search and discern his will through his word, through his leading, through other people in our life, through his other people in our life, once we search out his will and we know that, we can spend you know, time, you know, hours, weeks, months on that, then the request, the actual prayer, the ask, it's, to, it's done in a moment. God, now I know your will. Here's my request. And those two are aligned. That's the type of prayer that always works. And that's where Jesus taught us to pray. So as we look at, at what uh, the model prayer here in Matthew chapter 6, the disciples made the request, Lord, teach us to pray. And let's imagine that we're making that same request today of Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus teaches us to pray in the following ways. And we're going to walk verse by verse through this model prayer, this table of contents of prayer that he gives us. And the first thing that Jesus shows us is that prayer is always personal. Prayer is a personal uh, conversation that I get to have with God. Prayer is not transactional, meaning that if I put in my time, then God's got to spit, this other, uh, spit out this on the other side. If I do, if I say the right words, if I pray the right words, then God, it's like pulling a handle and God's going to give this on the other side. So here's how Jesus starts it in Matthew 6, 9. He says, pray then like this. Notice that first of all, he doesn't say pray these exact words. Because unfortunately, what has happened with this prayer, and many of you may have grown up in a tradition like this, where you just, you recited this prayer in church every single time you met. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And you just sort of say it over and over and over and over again. And that's not how Jesus meant for us to, to say this at all. He meant to us to, to see this and then to pray like this, not to pray exactly these words, but to use them as a guide for all of our prayers. And the first thing he shows us is that prayer is personal. So he says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, our Father who is in heaven, that there is a God on the other end of your prayers and that he wants a personal, personal relationship with you, that he doesn't want, he's not just out there in the cosmos somewhere, but that he wants a personal father relationship with you. And this is how Jesus taught us to pray. This is where it all starts. If we get this part down of our Father who is in heaven, the God of all the universe, the God who created everything, the God of the cosmos, the God who holds the universe together, when we begin to think about who God is and the greatness of God and the bigness of God and the majesty of God and the power of God and the glory of God and the goodness of God and the love of God, and then we begin to take all of that and begin to put it into, the, into place of like, God is my Father, the greatness, the goodness, the, the God of all creation. He is my father, that I am his son. I am his daughter. I have a personal relationship with the God who holds the universe in the palm of his hand. That's where Jesus starts. That's where you start. If you can get that, man, the rest of this, it just sort of falls in line. If you can get to the fact that Jesus is your, or excuse me, God is your personal father and you have a relationship with him through the son, through Jesus, that you are perfectly in love with Jesus. You are perfectly in relationship with God. He is your perfect heavenly father. You start right there. And it's a personal relationship. And the goal, the goal in your prayer is to get personal, not transactional. The goal is, is to, to come to God as a son, as a daughter, not come to God like he's an ATM machine where you put your card in, put the right codes in, and then it spits something out that you need and that you want. That's just transactional. No, I want to know him. I want to know every bit of it. I want to be in his presence. So let me ask, what comes to mind when you think about God? When you think about your prayer life and you think about how you pray, what comes to mind, what comes into your heart? 
Do you feel like you're trying to beg God for something, trying to pry his hand open, trying to, trying to get something out of him that you gotta try to perform the right way, say the right thing, do the right stuff, maybe live the right way? You know, do you start your prayers off like this? Of like, hey God, listen, I know I've kinda, I haven't done well and I promise I'll do better, but right now I just sorta need you to do that. All of that betrays what Jesus says here. All of that shows that we don't really believe what Jesus says here, that we come to God as our heavenly perfect father who wants us to come into his presence completely. And that he invites us into his presence. That Jesus invites you into his presence. Prayer is always personal. That there is a personal God on the other side of your prayers. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you've been a follower of Jesus for five seconds or 50 years. All of us have equal access to the God of the universe through Jesus. It's available to every single one of you. Billy Graham didn't have more access than you do. The Apostle Paul, let's just really put it into perspective. The Apostle Paul didn't have more access to God than you do. Because it's all through Jesus, and Jesus is available to every single one of us. Our Father, do you have that personal connection in your prayer? Do you start by reminding yourself, man, of who you are in Christ, who Jesus is to you, that you are a son, a daughter of the living God, that you are fully redeemed, fully loved, that grace is a part of your life, and that God the Father is now your perfect heavenly Father. That's where Jesus invites you to start your prayers. The second thing that Jesus shows us is that after prayer is personal, praise is my posture. True prayer, after I acknowledge of who God is and who I am in him, I I, I acknowledge my identity, I'm a son or daughter of God, that he's the God of the universe and he's in heaven, meaning that he's God and I am not, then what pours forth from that is praise. Man, when you begin to, I hope you hear it in my voice, when you begin to think about the goodness, the greatness of God, just you almost fall on your face. And in fact, I would encourage some of you to do that. I heard it some time ago in in a message on prayer the pastor challenged his people, and, and I took it to heart. The pastor challenged his people, of like, when you pray, really begin to pay attention to what your posture is. And I'm talking about your physical posture. Too often we just pray, like, we're just, we're, just, we're just sitting down. And here's what I would encourage you to do. This is maybe challenging to some of you, and it might feel strange to some of you, but I would challenge you to do this at some point, at least once this week, is in a time where you want to really pray, is to get down on your knees, put your face, your nose touching the carpet and hold your hands out straight just like this. Because that is a position of complete and utter helplessness. That's a position that communicates to you, to God, and to anyone who might see you. Nobody has to see you, but anyone who might see you, that you are completely and utterly powerless in your life and that you are, oh, your hands are open to receive everything that your good and perfect heavenly father wants to put into your life. I would encourage you to try that. Every time I put myself, when I put myself in that position where I'm on my knees, nose touching the carpet, hands out straight, eyes just closed or looking straight down, it's just you feel, you realize how utterly and completely helpless and yet at the same time how close and personal the God of the universe is there. That I'm weak, but through my weakness, he is strong. That I am strong in him, and I want to receive everything that he has for my life. Praise must become your posture, that I just fall down before the God of the universe. And this is the invitation that Jesus gives to us. So, So he says here, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, as he continues on. That word hallowed there, it's an old word, a word that we don't, you don't, you, know, you don't use that word very much. You, know, you could tell your husband or your, your wife this week, hey, babe, hallowed be your name. But the word means holy, set apart, unique. Jesus invites us to see that God is absolutely and utterly set apart, holy, unique to the world that we live in. There's nothing and no one like him. There's other people who will try to pretend. There's other small G gods who will try to pretend that they're like him. And and Jesus was dealing with that in this time and in this culture. And that's why he says, part of this, knowing that your father, first of all, know also that he is holy. And God calls us to be holy, set apart, just like he is holy. He is absolutely and utterly unique in all of the universe. No one is like our God. Nothing is like our God. Don't ever compare anything to our God. He is wholly different, wholly unique. And he is set apart from everything else in all of creation. 
He's not a part of creation. He's not, in the, he's not like the Star Wars force where he's here and there. And everything. He is in our creation. His presence is in our creation, but he's not, like, he's not mixed into it. He's set apart and holy, and we need to acknowledge the holiness and the goodness of who our God is, and it becomes praise. The next thing that Jesus tells us, and this is where it begins to turn. We've acknowledged that God is personal. We've acknowledged that he's holy. Now we align our will with his. Alignment is imperative at this point. Alignment is imperative. Let's look at the words of what Jesus says in verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everywhere else in the world, in fact, I I would even suggest every other religion is lived from earth up. But following Jesus is always lived from heaven down into my life. Everyone else has reversed that. It's it's what I want, I I bring it to the God, I bring my sacrifices to the God, I bring the, the right rituals, the right words, the right sacrifices to the God, and then he works and does in my life. So I bring this up to him, and then he brings it. No, 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 no. With our God, with Jesus, everything is reversed on that front. Jesus says, no, everything starts in heaven and then comes down into this earth. And I must align my life with what is going on in heaven. That my needs, God's will, all of it starts in heaven. Notice that it's your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And your kingdom come. Jesus tells us in Mark 1.15, like, repent for the kingdom of God is near. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the salvation and the goodness and the redemption of Jesus moving all throughout all of our lives and all throughout all of our community. That is the kingdom come. Anywhere you see redemption happen, where you see reconciliation happen, where you see salvation happen, where you see people growing and coming to know God, coming to know Jesus, where you see people worshiping, crying out to God in song and in praise and in prayer, all of that is God's kingdom coming among a people, and this is our desire, is that we want to see God's will done here in our presence on this earth, in this church, just as it's done in heaven, where God's will is always done perfectly. We want to see that done here on earth, done perfectly as well. I want to see God's will active in my life. I want to align myself with him. And so I spend mo- the majority, here's Jesus' encouragement, I think, to us, and his invitation to us is that we spend the majority of our time in prayer, searching, discerning, learning, submitting to the will of God. Jesus himself modeled this perfectly in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes, tells God, and, and prays this powerful prayer, but then he ends it with this very simple request, nevertheless, Not my will, but yours be done. And all of us need to spend as much time in prayer as necessary for all of us to be able to say those exact phrases and those exact words and have it be true. God, nevertheless, not your will, not my will, but your will be done. And I pray until it is all aligned. Now notice we've had Prayer is personal. We get to talk to the, to the living God, the God of all creation personally. He's our Father. It's praise, but now I've aligned my will. And only then, however long that takes, only then does Jesus then get to the point where we often start, which is asking. Now understand, here's what Jesus shows us. Asking is good. And he models that and he shows us that that's where we need to go to. And, and I understand 1 Peter 5, where it says, cast all your cares to God because he cares for you. You can, you, can, you can take your requests, and it's nothing wrong. It is good to take our needs, our requests, our, our, our hurts and our heartaches, and the things that we're praying for, the people that we're praying for. God asks us to do that, and he expects us to do that. But that's not all the prayer that we need to be praying But let's look at here when he says, asking is good. So verse 11, very simple request. Give us this day our daily bread. Now what Jesus is highlighting here is he's taking them back to Exodus. These were all people who knew and remembered the story of Exodus. And they remembered that in the desert, every single day, God provided manna from heaven for the people to eat. And he would tell them, collect just enough for that day. And if you collect any more, it's going to be rotten, and, and, and they would. If they would collect more than they needed for that day, the next day, what they had collected, it would, it would be full of maggots and, and rotted and, and disgusting. They'd have to go every single day 
It was a reminder and a trust that we are wholly and completely dependent upon the God who has led us here into the desert. We are wholly and completely dependent on the God who led us out of Egypt. And Jesus reminds us that we don't need to stop that kind of, that kind of prayer. That we are each and every day wholly and completely dependent upon the God who can meet our trust. Who can meet our needs. And he provides for them every single day. Too often in my prayer, I, I, I want to tell God, hey, God, show me what's going to happen six months from now. Show me what's going to happen six years from now or 10 years from now. God, if you'll just, if you'll just make it clear over the next, what's going to happen by, over the next year, God, that would help me so much. And, and I don't know if God's ever going to answer that prayer clearly because that's not the prayer God wants us to pray. I think the prayer God is more interested in is for me to say, God, show me what your will is for today because I trust you will be there tomorrow when I get there. God is more interested in me trusting him for tomorrow than in him telling me what the ne- tomorrow is going to look like. It's no, you, you trust me for today. You trust the God for, t- you trust God for today. He is the one in who ensures what will be tomorrow and the next day and the next after that. I don't have to know the future. I just have to know the God who controls that future. That's all that matters. And that's what Jesus invites you into, is to know him each and every day. Understand the amazing potential of this invitation, that you get to walk in the perfect relationship of having God meet your daily need that day. And then the next day, the same thing. Imagine the work that you get to see God do. Each and every day is a complete and utter gift from the hand of God. Asking is good. Align your will with his, ask him, because asking is good. Asking honors God. Nothing wrong with asking. We need to bring our requests to him. The next thing Jesus shows us is that forgiveness is real. Forgiveness is real. Pastor Marshall talked about this last week and did a phenomenal job talking about forgiveness last week. And we're going to look more at this idea of forgiveness in November of later this year. But Jesus highlights it here, the, the reality of forgiveness that is available to each and every one of us. He says here in verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now let's say this, let's understand this real quick. Jesus doesn't put a condition on his forgiveness of us. He doesn't put the condition like, okay, as long as you will forgive other people, then I will forgive you. That's not what Jesus is saying. What he is showing us is that when I truly understand what God has forgiven me, then I will forgive everyone else. Then I will have the power, I will have the resources of God's forgiveness to forgive all that has been done against me or, and everyone else in my life. So it starts by understanding what God has given to me and then out of that, I am able to give to others. Listen, hurt people, hurt people. Forgiven people, forgive people. You gotta understand that forgiveness is real. God's forgiveness is offered to every single one of you and it doesn't matter, I don't know all of your stories. God knows all of your stories. Jesus knows all of your stories and forgiveness is offered to every single person. Doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you did this morning before you got here. Forgiveness is the reality that is offered to you. And as you receive God's forgiveness, then you are able to give forgiveness to others. Forgiveness is the reality that we all need to receive and accept. And then lastly, Jesus reminds us that God's lead of my life is my only hope. That God will lead my life. That as I, as I get in touch and connect with my personal father and I praise him and I, that I align my will with his will and I ask according to his goodness and according to what he wants for my life, that he is then going to lead my life. This is why Paul tells us to pray consistently, pray constantly, because prayer is so vital to our lives that God leads us through prayer. So here it says in verse 13, Jesus wraps up this table of contents of prayer by saying, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
God's lead is at every moment of, our, of your life. Every moment of your life, you need God's lead, God's direction. There's not a moment that I go by that I don't need God's wisdom. I need God's wisdom the moment I wake up and every single moment for that day on. I need his wisdom. The good news is that God tells us that if we need wisdom in James, all he tells us you got to do is ask for wisdom and God will give it graciously. We pray and ask, God, God, I need you to lead me in this conversation. God, I need you to lead me in my parenting. God, I need you to lead me in my work. God, I need to lead you to lead me in my financial decisions. God, I need you to lead me as the husband that, I, that you've called me to be. Because, God, I don't have the wisdom to do it on my own. But, God, I trust that you tell me you're not going to lead me into temptation, but you're going to deliver me from evil, which is sometimes me. So, God, lead me with your wisdom. Lead me with your grace. Lead me with your mercy. Lead me with your love. I want to be your will to be my will. I want to take each step being led by you god leads you everywhere every moment this pray consistently pray constantly you you going into a meeting at work pray before that god i need your wisdom here i need you to lead me and then be sensitive to what god says even during that conversation during that moment you need to have a conversation with your kids pray and ask god god i need wisdom here parenting is hard enough parenting is so hard all of us want to get parenting right we need God's wisdom to do it. And he graciously gives it when we ask. That's the good news. So where do we bring all of this to? The prayer that I want to encourage you to begin to pray this week is a simple prayer of align, then ask. That's where all prayer begins. Align, what does that mean? I align my will with God's will. Then I ask. Then I make my requests. It's not to downplay the importance of our requests. But it's to raise the level of importance of understanding and knowing God's will for your life. Knowing God's will for that day for your life. 1 John 5, 14 says it perfectly. It says, this is the confidence that we have towards him. The confidence. You want confidence in life? You want confidence in your prayers? You want to know that your prayers are touching the heart of God and you're getting the power of God in your life? This is the kind of prayer that you pray. The confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Whatever you ask according to his will, he answers. His answer is yes and amen. Whatever you ask according to his will, he hears that prayer. And he acts on that prayer. And he moves on that prayer. Align. And then ask. Now those are three words that as I say them, I realize they are very easy to say. I mean, all of us, we could walk out of here today. When someone asks you what the sermon was about, y'all talk about it at lunch. What was it about today? It was about prayer. I got to align myself with God's will. Then I get to ask. Align, then ask. It's very simple to say. It's really difficult to do. Because what it requires is full and complete submission to him. Complete submission, complete submission to his will, complete submission to his desire, complete submission to who he is in my life. Align, then ask. But imagine with me if you can get to that place. Imagine with me as you get to that place where you are fully and completely aligned with the God of the universe, the God who is your father, the God who calls you his son, his daughter, the God who redeemed you, the God who reconciled you, the God who wants to know you, the God who wants you to know him perfectly and personally. Imagine as you get to that place where you are completely aligned with his will. Imagine what you're gonna get to see God do. Who knows, maybe one day they'll write the book about you, about you were in your house one day and you had a need come. And you prayed, and then a moment later, someone knocked on that door and met that need because you were aligned, and then you asked. When I think about life, I think about uh, one picture that I think about is life is a lot like a, a wave pool. You don't know when that machine's gonna get kicked on, and when it does, those waves, they just keep coming at you. Whether you're ready or not, you could be at the deep end, and those waves come, and they'll just start overwhelming you, overwhelming you, overwhelming you. And you don't know when it's gonna start, you don't know when it's gonna stop. When that horn sounds, it's on. And life can feel that way, those waves just coming at you, and it's just overwhelming, overwhelming, overwhelming. But you put that in perspective when you think about life feels like that, but God's love is like the ocean. And you could take that whole, all of my needs that might be, let's say, represented in the waves coming at me like that. You put all of that in the ocean and God can take it all. 
You align, then you ask. Because aligning, then asking, here's what it does. When I align, I begin to pray the prayers that I would pray if I knew everything that God knows. Those are the prayers that God answers. Those are the prayers that see God work. Those are the prayers that see mountains move in your life. Align, then ask.